Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. All right. I have a confession to make. When I started at FIRE in 2012 as assistant to the president, I was assistant to Greg Lukianoff, um, who's been on the show before, who you're all familiar with. Back in 2012, I didn't know who Lenny Bruce was. Um, Greg would mention him as being a pioneer in both comedy and free speech, and that meant very little to me. His name had never come up before. Um, Greg often likes to talk about things for which I'm not familiar, like comic books. He, he says, you know, he referenced comic book characters. I sort of nod my head and try to divert the conversation elsewhere. But it became pretty obvious to me before long that Lenny Bruce was someone who I needed to know about. Uh, he was someone who was important to the world of free speech that we at FIRE live in. So one day I left the office in Philadelphia and went back home to my apartment in West Philly. And opened up a web browser and typed in the name Lenny Bruce. And I was shocked at what I found. Oh, I'll end up like a schmuck with a Dixie cup and a thread. <laughs> That's all I've had. He was indeed a legend. Uh, he was indeed a pioneer. I watched the movie Lenny featuring Dustin Hoffman, award-winning movie. He was a comic, a cynic, a satirist, a criminal, a genius. The New York Post called him a kind of prophet. I'm just a comic. Dustin Hoffman, Lenny. I watched the documentary, Swear to Tell the Truth, narrated by Robert De Niro. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is what is. And what should be is a fantasy, a terrible, terrible lie that someone gave the people long ago. And learned that Lenny created a brand of comedy that nobody else was doing when Lenny was performing in the 1950s and 60s. He was talking about himself. He had this personal quality. He would talk about taboo subjects while other comedians were doing bada boom and knock knock jokes. He would talk about organized religion. All right, who's here? Christ and Moses. Are you putting me on now? I'm telling you they're here. He would skewer revered politicians and call out America for its attitudes about race and homosexuality. The comedy that you hear today was pioneered by Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, more contemporary comedians like Amy Schumer and Louis C.K. Their personal quality, they're using their lives to tell jokes is something that Lenny did. And Lenny did this to help people put their guards down. People laugh, their guards go down, they consider other points of view. Jon Stewart was also a pioneer in this regard. Today is the 50th anniversary of Lenny Bruce's death August, uh, on August 3rd in 1966. And I am here in my apartment today um, because tonight Fire is hosting a celebration of Lenny's life in Manhattan. Uh, we've been doing a lot with Lenny Bruce lately. You all recall the episode previous to this where we interviewed the daughters of George Carlin, Richard Pryor and Lenny Bruce, the three top comedians, according to Comedy Central's list of 100 top comedians. Um, and I've been talking quite regularly about uh, the movie that we're coming out with, Can We Take a Joke, which looks at what happened when comedy and censorship collide on, off and, on and off campus uh, using Lenny Bruce as a through line. And today I am joined by a star of the film, Ron Collins. Uh, Ron is a scholar at the University of Washington School of Law, where he specializes in First Amendment law and constitutional law. He also happens to be the co-author of The Trials of Lenny Bruce, which carefully documents Lenny's career and free speech struggles. Ron, thanks for coming to the show. It's a delight to be here. I appreciate you coming up uh, to Manhattan to celebrate Lenny's life and to uh, educate a new generation about Lenny Bruce, because I imagine a lot of people listening today were as are as unfamiliar with Lenny as I was back in uh, 2012. So, Ron, you're standing on a corner of Manhattan in 1950s or 60s. Lenny Bruce is performing in a comedy club. His name is on the marquee. 
and someone comes up to you and asks you who that is, how would you respond? Well, if it's late 1950s, early 1960s, um, I'd say this guy's like nobody else. You really, you really have to hear it. It's like he's from some other planet, and yet he is quintessentially American. There's something uninhibited about this guy. Um, I really can't put my finger on it, but he's not he's like no other comedian I've ever seen. I mean, the mother-in-law jokes, the white of the chicken cross the road jokes. If that's your shtick, don't go to see Lenny Bruce. On the other hand, if you have a problem with hypocrisy, then you're really gonna like Lenny Bruce. Now, mind you, even if you like him, he may knock you out of your chair sometime because the guy, maybe it's just the way he's wired, but I think he gets off on pricking us, offending us, and at his best moments, making us to rethink what we thought we knew. I would like an honest equation from any, at least, grammar school graduate. Is the word son of a bitch less obscene to you than motherfucker? Really? Is it the fact that a Catholic president called all businessmen son of a bitches in a Jewish comic relates motherfucker? If you're interested in the meaning of obscenity, I'm less obscene than the president. If the word motherfucker stimulates you sexually, you're in a lot of trouble. Lenny's had an interesting childhood, to say the least. Um, what, how did he grow up, and how might that have influenced the person that he become and his outlook on life and his comedy? I'm a law professor. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, <laughs> not a psychologist. A psychologist. Uh, although I imagine um, you could bring a room full of Freudians and they'd have a field day uh, with Lenny Bruce and his, you know, where he grew up, his Jewish background his mother, um, the um, striptease uh, dancer, Hot Honey Harlow, as she was known, that he married. Um, his mother was, she own, did she own a burlesque house? Or? She did, she yeah. did. Uh, and that was the world uh, that Lenny grew up in. He felt very comfortable uh, in that world. Um, was the die cast then? Maybe. Um, maybe, but um, although he liked to joke a lot about it, there was more, much more, uh, to Lenny Bruce than, as he put it, tits and ass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, he'd always been a bit of a troublemaker. He was dishonorably discharged from the Navy. Uh, he was. He, uh, you know, Lenny Bruce was one of those folks where, uh, you know, the line was drawn, and he delighted in, in crossing it. Um, that's... Part of what made him both famous mm-hmm. and infamous. Mm-hmm. And so he was dishonorably discharged from the Navy and uh, for performing in drag, if I'm not mistaken. Right? <laughs> right. That's right. Um, right. And then he decided. Gay Lenny. I, and then he decided. Yeah. And then he decided to get into comedy. Do you have any idea why he decided to get into comedy? Or well, because I think it just came naturally to him. Mm-hmm. I mean. Um, young Lenny, I mean, his whole persona uh, was wrapped up in comedy, in uh, mocking uh, traditional uh, mores, in, um, if you will, toying with taboos. My name is Adolf Eichmann. My defense, I was a soldier. I saw the end of a conscientious day's effort. I saw all the work that I did. I watched through the portals. I saw every Jew burned and turned into soap. Do you people think yourselves better because you burned your enemies at long distances with missiles without ever seeing what you had done to them? Hiroshima, ach, Wiedersehen. I mean, he felt very comfortable there. Now, it did take him a while. I mean, when he first appears, I think in 1948, on the um, Arthur... um, can't think of the guy's last name. It starts with a G. Arthur Godfrey. 
uh, show, television show, which was really kind of a Americana show. Um, you know, that Lenny, that early Lenny, was uh, a lot different than he would be oh, yes. ten years later. Yes, yes. What kind of co comedy does he do? Oh, impersonations, mimicry. Oh, wonderful. And what's his name? Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce. Let's bring him on. Thank you, Mrs. Bruce. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's great to see the television is coming in so strong in Vaudeville. You know, the action I get the biggest kick out of are the impersonators. I love it when they come out and say, All right, George, I want you to stay off the north side. You stay off the south side. You stay off the west side. You stay off the north side and you stay off the east side. I'm glad there's no more sides. Or they go, Please, get out of here. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And besides that, I don't like you. But I think um, the idea of being stand-up, you know, kind of just, if you will, uh, releasing your inhibitions, came very natural um, um, to him. Mm -hmm. He he got a start in uh, strip clubs. He did. Yeah. He did. And wild strip clubs they were. I mm -hmm. mean, these weren't just clubs where there was tits and ass. I mean, there was a lot of crazy, <laughs> wild uninhibited, robust, and always wide open antics going on in some of these clubs. I mean, uh, 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 these would have made uh, uh, Dionysius a blush, uh, <laughs> what was going on. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's not an exaggeration to say that in some of these clubs, I mean, they were so rowdy and raunchy. Um, they were almost like Bacchanalian revelries. I mean... I don't know that there's any club in the United States anymore like some of those clubs. And a lot of them were out um, in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, which back in the 50s was like, um, you know, the Wild West. I mean, mm -hmm. it really was, you know, the outer boundaries, not only of Los Angeles, but also of civilized culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and, and and he felt completely comfortable in um in those uh in those joints yeah well i mean given his upbringing with his mother who worked in in burlesque houses but when you know you like that little freudian piece <laughs> there i see so tell me doctor <laughs> well his whole life is just fascinating yeah, yeah. I mean, he we have we talk about lenny bruce today as this uh stand-up philosopher brandeis magazine uh you, Brandeis is putting out Lenny Bruce's archives later this year. By the way, that uh, article in Brandeis Magazine, a shout out to Alex Wall, one of my former students. Wrote, oh, really? Uh, wrote that piece. It was, it was yeah. an excellent article. It's a yeah. couple thousand word piece that goes through Lenny's entire life and really hones in. Uh, on... So you see, Alex, I did plug you. <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Yeah, but he uses the word stand up philosopher at, yeah. the, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, you know, let me, let me take issue with that. Um, at his best, that is certainly true. Uh, and, and that's what separated him from a lot of other the comedians of his time. Mort Saul actually had some of that, but there was no edge to Mort Saul. Uh, you know, he was thoughtful, he was witty. Uh, nobody remembers Mort Saul today. Uh, I think he's still alive, but he might as well be dead. Um, uh, I'd just say that as far as his comedy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not in any way... Yeah, we're not uh, here talking about Mort Saul. We're uh, talking uh, yeah, about but, but, yeah. but, but, um, uh but, you know, there were times, and, and we can get to this later when we talk about the First Amendment, there were times when there really wasn't a whole lot of philosophy going on, that there really wasn't a lot of social commentary going on. It was just um, kind of raunch, if you will, a uh, funny raunch. Uh, so I don't do, want to... Do you have some examples? Well, I mean, you know, you know some, 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 some... Well, the thing is, is there were two Lenny Bruces. There were the Lenny Bruces that were on the records, or at least the records um, done during his lifetime. And then there was the Lenny Bruce of the comedy clubs. Mm -hmm. And the Lenny Bruce of the comedy clubs really wasn't um, kind of as polished and as sanitized as the Lenny Bruce in the clubs. I mean, some of those things he did in the San Fernando Valley, I mean, they were just so wild, so over the top. I think there was one time when he actually urinated in somebody, <laughs> on somebody in the front stage, the front row, who was um, complaining about him. You know, uh -huh. so this is how th think how crazy things got. Now, I don't want to suggest uh, that um, pissing on patrons is protected under the First Amendment, um, uh, for clearly it's not. Um, but. Uh, uh, 
you know, I, I think this is one of the things that happens with our heroes, with our icons. You know, we, we want to hold them up as kind of, to borrow a phrase from Bob Dylan, from, as kind of flesh-colored Christs that glow in the dark. Mm -hmm. And as, he, as he, Dylan said, it's, easily, it's easy to see without looking too far that not much is really sacred. You know, um, Lenny Bruce was a comedian like no other. He was a social critic like no other. He was a comic philosopher like no other. But he was also fucking raunchy like no other. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, is and we t we'll get to this later when we talk about the First Amendment and what it protects and why it protects it. But I think you have to see him. I don't like to see the sanitized Lenny. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, I like him when he's, you know, bits like Religions Incorporated, when he's really going after the hypocrisy in religion, or mm -hmm. Christ and Moses, you know, yeah. or when he's attacking the law and the morality and immorality of the law in routines like blah, 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 blah. I swear that he didn't, what he say, Your Honor, he said blah, blah, blah. The judge, he said blah, blah, blah. <laughs> then the guy really yented it up. That's right. I didn't believe it. There was a guy up on the stage in front of women in a mixed audience saying blah, blah, blah. The judge. Well, this I never heard. Blah, blah, blah. He said blah, blah, blah. He said blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to lie to you. It's in the minutes. I'm not going to lie to you. All right. The DA. The guy said blah, blah, blah. Look at him. He's smug. He's not going to repent. Then they dug something. They sort of like saying blah, blah, blah. <laughs> because they said it a few extra times. Um, oh, look, I mean, I love those pieces, and I think those really stand out. But... Um, if we're going to be fair and we're going to be honest, um, he wasn't always a philosopher. <laughs> well, the, I've been reading a lot about Lenny Bruce lately as I try to educate myself as a member Yeah, there's of a young... great book. Yeah. Uh, well, what's the name of that book? Uh, the Trials of Lenny Bruce. Which, oh, yeah. Which I, you can find online. Yeah, the right. Fall and Rise of an American Icon. Oh, I thank you. And my family thanks you. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I've been reading a lot about him. People say there's like three Lenny Bruces. There's the Lenny Bruce, the early Lenny Bruce, um, you know, who's a little bit safer. And then there was, uh, people talk about how there was like an 18th month period where Lenny Bruce was at the top of his game and that before he started getting busted uh, in comedy clubs for his act uh, and before he started sort of bombing on stage or insofar as he spent most of his time talking about his persecutions. Yeah, there were three Lenny Bruce's. I mean, at least for the time being, you know, we like to put things in yeah, categories. And, and, but that's fine. That's fine. I mean, um, yeah, there were three Lenny Bruce's, but but there were only two Lenny Bruce's that were comedians. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, the safe Lenny and the uninhibited Lenny. Mm -hmm. What came after the third Lenny Bruce? <laughs> he just, and I wrote about this uh, today when he appeared in February of 1966 at UCLA. Uh, speaking just a few months before um, he died. And, you know, by that time he was so obsessed with the law and his faith, the faith that had befallen him, that for all practical purposes, he was really no longer a comedian. Yeah. He ceased to be funny. He was pathetic. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you think about that word and its Greek origins, um, it's not funny. It's tragic. Well, let's talk about the origins of that tragedy, um, you know, uh, it's sort of sad. What what happened to Lenny Bruce? What actually? Let's let's take another step back. How did Lenny Bruce become famous? Because I'm reading a lot of this stuff, and you know, it sounds like he's starting in he's starting in these strip houses where no one's uh, presumably no one in the enter, no entertainment mogul is going to catch him. But he soon is you know on the Steve Allen show, and he's making two hundred thousand dollars a year. How does how does he get to that point? Yeah, and, and he also, I mean, he was hardly educated, right? No, what that's right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, for a guy we so, talk about being um, a stand-up philosopher or some do, I know. Um, you know, what, ninth grade education? Yeah, yeah, if that, if uh -huh. that. Uh, and, um, you know, like Hugo Black, just as Hugo Black, who self-taught, uh, um, not that Lenny Bruce was Hugo Black, but they, they did have a number of things in common. Uh, by the way, speaking of Hugo Black, um, there's a famous line from Hugo Black, and I just want to throw it out there, and we can come back to it, and then I'll, I promise to get back to your question. Um, 
He comes in a dissent he wrote in 1961. This while Lenny Bruce was having his problems with the law it's in a case called In Re Anastopolo. And at the end of the dissent, he said, we must not be afraid to be free. And I was just, the first time I heard that in law school, I was blown away. Mm-hmm. But actually I read it you know, in a dissenting opinion. And I thought, wow, you know, uh, freedom is something that at some point we fear. Mm-hmm. And really what was more than anything the trigger in Lenny Bruce is he did not fear freedom. I think that is really essential to what he was and who he became and how his life. Now, fear uh, is a good thing and a bad thing, right? Yeah. I mean, well, when I... you're faced with danger, when there are three cops in the back of the audience waiting for you to say cocksucker, and you say it, and everybody laughs, and they haul you off to jail. As they did right at the Gate of Horn, right? Gate of Horn, yes. In Chicago. Uh, yes, boy, you're on top of this guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed. Um, uh, you know, funny to the, uh, to the audience, uh, funny to read about it, but, you know, it meant that he was arrested. And so, kind of getting back to your question, so late, late 50s, early 60s, uh, he's releasing records. It's kind of a new comedy. It's called Sick Comedy, you mm-hmm. know, because Lenny was saying things... I mean, he was talking about religion. He was talking about law. He was talking about morality. At Ann's 440 in San Francisco, believe it or not, he's talking about homosexuality, you know. I mean, people, you know, this was just not something that was part of the vernacular, not even in comic clubs, you know. Uh, And... um, so this is how he kind of, and as he comes into his being, it's about the same time. Remember, he's a culture, he's a creature of the 50s, yeah. the beat culture, yeah. you know, uh, Jack Kerouac, Alan Burroughs, oh, Alan, um, Allen Ginsberg, Jack, Allen Ginsberg, <laughs> William Burroughs, <laughs> all of those guys. But he kind of catapults into the counterculture with the advent of Bob Dylan uh-huh. and the whole hippie movement. And so, and also jazz. Jazz was very important. Yeah, you know, and people it, say it, the rhythm of his comedy sort of has a jazz feel to it. What well, the it? reason it had, one of the reasons it had a jazz feel is there were jazz performers, mm-hmm. uh, musicians accompanying him with his routines. Yeah, what was that one? Uh, to come, the preposition. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget the name of that. Two is to come. Um, you're catching me now, 13 years after I co-authored this book <laughs> with David Scover. David, yep. there's your name. I'm, uh, I didn't forget you. Um, uh, so forgive me. But uh, yeah, you know, that uh, that uh, particular routine, um, uh, along with others, he did with jazz accompaniments. Two. Preposition. Two is preposition. Come is a verb. Two is a preposition. Come is a verb. Two is a preposition. Come is a verb. The verb intransitive. To come. To come. I've heard these two words my whole adult life. And as a kid when I thought I was sleeping. To come. To come. It's been like a big drum solo. Did you come? Did you come? Good. Did you come good? 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 Rest with our teeth. I come better with you, sweetheart, than anyone in the whole goddamn world. So there was something revolutionary, you know, mm-hmm. and this was the rage. This was the this was the counter revolution, and so a part of him fit very neatly into that, you know. Yeah. Um, and very soon he'd be wearing Nehru jackets. He wouldn't be wearing a suit and tie anymore. And there were people like Steve Allen. It's incredible. Steve Allen. People may not know that name today, but this TV host who was also a public intellectual and a public intellectual committed to free speech, even speech that he disagreed with. And so immediately there was a bond between these two. We get uh, a great deal of mail from our viewers commenting on our sketches, (laughs) indicating their likes and dislikes. And uh, whether you realize it or not, there is just about no joke or sketch particularly of a satirical sort that will not offend somebody, you know, a cowboy or a drunk or somebody. 
We, I don't want to equate those two already. I can see the cards are coming in. So tell you how we are going to face the problem. We have decided that once a month, we will book a comedian who will offend everybody. <laughs> Fair enough? All right, and then we'll get it all over with, you see? A man who will disturb a great many social groups watching right now. Because, as I'm serious, his satirical comments refer to many things not ordinarily discussed on television, and it serves you right. Now, that way, the NBC mail department will know in advance, right, that the complaints are coming in, they hire three or four extra girls, they get the stamp answers ready, we're very sorry, we didn't mean, you know, that sort of thing. And then the whole thing is handled with neatness and dispatch. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is a very shocking comedian, the most shocking comedian of our time, a young man who is skyrocketing to fame, Lenny Bruce. Here he is. But you might be interested in how I became offensive. <laughs> And by 1960, you know, he's making a couple hundred grand a year. He's becoming the, like the counterculture um, mm -hmm. hero. Uh, and and with, he really felt most at home in the clubs, mm -hmm. you know. And although the clubs weren't wa as wild as they were in those San Fernando Valley days, um, he really kind of, if you will, tilted back to that and so he always felt the need to take it to the next level yeah and when he did that's when the police knocked on lenny bruce's door yeah and he wasn't the only member of that beat generation you know ellen ginsburg's howell i mean that was happening at the same time as it? 1957 in san francisco now a lot of people make the mistake not that you did but Actually, Allen Ginsberg wasn't prosecuted. The prosecution was for the sale of the book, and yeah. that was Lawrence Ferlinghetti and his clerk. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> it was funny because um, uh, Allen Ginsberg wrote the poem, but Ferlinghetti and his, his clerk paid the dues, but they prevailed. Yeah, they did. And Lenny ultimately, at some point, got the same lawyer as, as them, right? Same lawyer and same judge uh -huh. in San Francisco. More about Al Bendick and and Judge uh, Clayton Horn in a moment. Yeah. So what was the first time Lenny was brought up, uh, you know, whether it was obscenity charges or some other charges for the content of his act? And when did, when did this all start? What's the year? Yeah, uh, just as a preface to this, I mean, you pointed out uh, how you didn't know Lenny Bruce. Uh, I didn't. And if you had talked to me in 1985 or 1990, uh, I really didn't know uh, maybe I knew the name, but I, he's before my time, even though I was born in 1949. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I never went to any Lenny Bruce shows. Uh, I don't think I could get in. Um, so I, I did want to do a shout out to the person I think um, um, was responsible for um, sending David Scover and myself down the Primrose Path. Um, and that's uh, somebody we dedicated a book to and we referred to her as the First, liber uh, the first Lady of the, of the First Amendment, or the First Lady of Liberty, is how I think we tagged it. And that's Nadine Strawson, the former president of the ACLU. Uh, years ago, she sent me a book by Martin Garbus, who was one of the attorneys for Lenny in New York. And there was a chapter in there on Lenny Bruce, and I read it, and I thought, wow, I'd never seen that. <laughs> it's like, it was Lenny Bruce, comedy, and First Amendment. I was definitely interested in the First Amendment, and I'd read a book by Albert Goldman, long biography it was like the definitive biography everything about lenny bruce was there but there was something that was missing the law <laughs> you know and if you're a lawyer and you're a law professor and your background is in first amendment as was david's um we thought god this is an incredible story that's never been told and so when we wrote the trials of lenny bruce which came out in 2002 the perspective was a biography of lenny bruce told through the lens of the first amendment in his obscenity trials so Let's go back and, and, and think about these obscenity trials. Um, they start off, and just think of the places where they happened. San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. I mean, we're not talking the Midwest. No. We're not going to talk in the South. And we're talking in the 60s. And we're talking in clubs um, where the performances were often after midnight. Moreover, in all of the clubs that Lenny Bruce performed, to the best of my knowledge, no one ever complained to the police. Um, no one who attended, attended the, shows. the shows. There was yeah. a complaint uh, in New York once, um, uh, but but it was by, a, I think, a social critic. Um, 
But, you know, the audience, you know, people, people were offended and they just get up and walk out. Mm-hmm. You know, you vote with your feet. Um, and his problems began um, in uh, San Francisco, I think in 1961, um, at a place called the Jazz Workshop. And just to see things in perspective, um, they began in 1961 on October 1st. Um, and they end on November 4th, 1964. So that's the period of time, October 1st, 61, when he's first busted yeah. um, in San Francisco to November 4th, 1964, when he's convicted in New York. Okay, these are all obscenity busts, uh, word crimes. So yeah. San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, 35 months non-stop persecution and prosecution, and I tallied it just for your show, <laughs> 1,062 days of non-stop persecution and prosecution of Lenny Bruce. Um, you know, that's remarkable. I mean, you try to um, think about um, how a man is going to continue to make a living. I mean, once you're busted at a club, then the next thing that happens is the club's told that if they let you perform again, they will be busted. Yep. Now, that the club owner was not prosecuted, to the best of my knowledge, of the Troubadour in Los Angeles. By the way, the Troubadour is still there, so if you want to go there, you can. Mm-hmm. at least it was there two years ago when I was in Los Angeles. But they were at the uh, Café Go-Go. Yeah. Uh, Gator uh, Horn. The Gator Horn, uh, Alan Ribback. Um, I mean, there were some incredible performances at these clubs, including the Gate of Horn in Chicago. Neither of which exist anymore. No, no. And Alan Ruback was told that if he continued to let Lenny Bruce perform, uh, they would shut him down. And they did. And, you know, uh, Alan Ruback and the Gate of Horn never opened again. Um, well, I mean, some of these club owners are heroes in their own right. Well, I want to get to that. Yeah. yeah. You're, but my God, you're doing a great job. Um, uh, you should get a raise. Um, hear that, Greg? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, as he slips me a bill here. Um, you know, then you go to law, um, uh, uh, Los Angeles. Um, you know, you had the jazz workshop in San Francisco. Uh, you had... The Gate of Horn in Chicago. You had the Troubadour in Los Angeles. There was also a place called the Trolley Ho that he was busted. And then um, the Cafe Agogo uh, in New York. In the, in the village, Greenwich yeah, Village. Yeah, in Greenwich Village. And to think that in 1964, a guy's going to be arrested for using colorful language in a club in Greenwich Village after midnight in New York where nobody complained. I mean, it's a mind fuck. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not like it's not like nobody ever said cocksucker or motherfucker or any of the seven dirty words. I mean, obviously people were saying that in clubs. I, I'll be not a lot of them, but Lenny Bruce wasn't the first. It wasn't the words. The fact was Lenny was offending people. He was offending religions. He was offending politicos. He was offending mores. He traveled in taboo. That's what the words allowed the prosecutors, uh, particularly in places like Chicago, to come after him. Yeah. Uh, so you know, well, in, go ahead. Wasn't there wasn't there one police officer in Chicago who's on the record having told Lenny Bruce that they were arresting him for making fun of the Pope, and he said, "And I'm saying that as a Catholic." Yeah. No. No. And it, it is true. I mean, and, and it's true. I mean, you can't even fathom that today. Yeah, you know, if it wasn't so tragic, uh, it would be comic. But when Lenny Bruce was busted, I mean, basically he was busted for blasphemy uh, or variations. But you didn't have any blasphemy. No, laws no, no. Then, blasphemy right? laws had already been declared unconstitutional. And the guy that won that case that had blasphemy laws declared unconstitutional was Ephraim London, who would be one of Lenny Bruce's Lenny. New York lawyers, hmm. um, but but so Lenny goes to uh, to trial in Chicago uh, before um, an Irish Catholic judge, and there's only two Jews in the room. Lenny and his lawyer, and Lenny looks around and he gets a little freaked and he says to his lawyer, "They look around. He looks around and he notices that everybody in the room except Lenny and his lawyer have something in common." They all had ashes on their forehead. It was Ash Wednesday. And Lenny turned to his lawyer and said, not a good sign for a Jew boy. And he's right. Yeah. They, they convicted him. 
Um, you know, so just a quick shout out to the owners. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, these folks. Um, you know, there is Alan Riback in um, in Chicago. Um, uh, you know, in 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 New York, um, we have Howard Solomon, uh, and who you've met, who you've met before. Yeah, yeah, yeah who's passed away now. Um, and you know, to their credit, I mean, these guys would have been much easier, much safer for them to say, you know, Lenny, we're we're with you, but just tone it down. And if you can't, mm-hmm. you're gonna have to show you the door. I mean, losing your license is a big fucking deal. It's really big. And, you know, for all of us to kind of, in our safe spots, applaud them and say, right on and right on, you know, the fact is that they were really paying um, the dues. And so I think sometimes people will forget are the club owners uh, and the lawyers who Mm -hmm. came to their defense. Yeah. The the lawyers that came to... So Lenny was only convicted... Well, he was convicted... He won on appeal a couple times, right? He yeah. was only ultimately convicted and then sentenced in New York. Uh, right, right. Yeah. So, to four um, months, and this was in 65, four. 64. Four. So, by the way, a uh, quick plug to Al Bendick. In 1957, Al Bendick was a young lawyer for the ACLU, and when the Fairland Getty case came up involving the, perse- the prosecution um, of Howell, the poem, uh, the ACLU lawyer that made the difference in that case was Al Bendick. Yeah. He was not the lead counsel, but he was the guy that did the points and authorities. And and uh, it really had... He would also be Lenny Bruce's lawyer in San Francisco when Lenny Bruce was charged. But there was a judge, and a big shout out to this guy. Um, his name was Clayton Horn. He presided, presided over the obscenity trial uh, uh, of, uh, of Howell in 1957. And if you would have, at that time, if that case was coming before Judge... Um, uh, uh, that judge, um, you would have said, there's no way, no way, zip, that this guy will ever rule in our favor. The guy was the Sunday school teacher. He was a man of faith. I mean, he had sentenced women convicted of, of uh, a petty theft uh, to see the Ten Commandments. The movie. The movie, yeah. At that time, yeah. And uh, Clayton Horn was his name. And... Not only did he um, rule in favor of the First Amendment claim. Now, mind you, he was a municipal judge. I mean, these guys do traffic, you know, dog barking cases, like kind of nothing. Mm-hmm. And he did something that, that, a, that a, uh, a judge in that situation, misdemeanor judge, never does. Uh, he wrote an opinion. It was unpublished because they didn't publish the opinions of those judges. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, uh, it was just an incredible um, uh, statement of First Amendment principles. And so in, when, when Lenny's case comes before that same judge, you know, in 1961, I think it was, I, and Al Bendick has now represented him. So mm-hmm. now you think, my God, this is the perfect judge. And yeah. what does do, Lenny do? He demands, although Al Bendick suggested to the contrary, a jury trial. And the jury was prepared to convict Lenny except for the jury instructions that Al Bendick wrote and that the judge, Clayton Horn, insisted be given. So Lenny Bruce's um, uh, uh, success in his San Francisco trial was due to Al Bendick and Clayton Horn. Mm -hmm. Uh, And two remarkable, we lost Al last year, one remarkable. And he was also the lawyer for Fantasy Records that did Lenny Bruce's um, comedy records. Oh, I did not know that. So So, a great ACLU. uh, Yeah, was he litigating on behalf of the ACLU? Yes, he was. The first time he was. Because I I read Paul Krasner's. uh, Paul Krasner was the editor of Lenny Bruce's autobiography, How to Win Friends and Influence, uh, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People, Uh, a great a great title for a book like that, also being re-released right now by his daughter, Kitty Bruce, who Mm -hmm. we interviewed on the last podcast. But he says in this LA Times op-ed, remembering Lenny Bruce, um, he reflects upon a letter he received from Lenny two months before his death. Uh, Lenny wrote to me, he said, I'm still working on the bust of the government of New York State. He included in his letter a doodle of Christ nailed to a crucifix with a speech balloon asking, where the hell is the ACLU? What do you think Lenny was referring to there? Well, um, so for the first time, Al Bendick uh, represented um, 
um, uh, when he did the Howell case, he was with the ACLU. When he did Representative Lenny, he was um, uh, a private, pri- well, no, private attorney. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, still doing ACLU work, but yeah. representing. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, yeah, where was uh, the ACLU then? Well, uh, let me let me put it this way: um, Lenny didn't lack means uh, mm-hmm. to pay for attorneys, and usually they come in when somebody doesn't have the money. Uh, and all the lawyers that represented him, I mean, I'm sure that Paul Krasner loves taking a dig at the ACLU. <laughs> uh, more power to him. I mean, there are times when I have my differences with that great organization. Um, but, oh, and to be clear, Fire is great fans of the ACLU. Well, yeah, as, we just as, interviewed Arya Nair. Yeah, know. no, no, as, as, as am I. I'm, I'm a card-carrying uh, ACLUer. But, um, uh, you know, the fact is that all of his attorneys, uh, if they weren't doing pro bono work for the ACLU, were all ACLU sympathizers. Mm-hmm. So I think it's more of a matter of form over substance. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus, none of his cases really went to appeal except the Illinois one. Uh, the Illinois one, he's found guilty. Um, and and then the case goes to the Illinois Supreme Court, and he's represented by three incredible uh, University of Chicago graduates, Harry Calvin, the noted First Amendment scholar, Maurice Rosenfield, who had been Hugh Hefner's uh, lawyer, and uh, William Ming, who... And Harry wrote, Calvin wrote the Calvin Report for the University of Chicago. Yeah. It was a glowing statement on free speech yeah. that was... Well, uh, Jeffrey Stone sort of piggybacked on absolutely in 2015. A, a very a very prominent scholar along with his friend Maurice Rosenfield and another friend William Ming William Ming I mean these guys were uh, Ming was one of the co-authors of the brief in Brown versus Board he mm-hmm. worked with the NAACP he was the first African American professor in Chicago I mean these three guys this is a powerhouse team and they represent him in the Illinois Supreme Court and they lose and then not long thereafter the Illinois Supreme Court did something bizarre. It um, asked for rebriefing in the case, and it re- it uh, reversed itself. It reversed itself oh. and ruled in favor. The good news was that Lenny Bruce's um, conviction had been reversed, but but um, Calvin had hoped and his colleagues to take the case to the Supreme Court uh, to really use this case as the Deal. poster child for a new and invigorated First Amendment when it came to sexual expression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when when the case went the way it did, um, that moment uh, never happened. Yeah. Lenny did a, a lot of comedy about his his persecutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he has that famous line, in the halls of justice, the only justice is in the halls. Uh, he had a lot of very good First Amendment philosophy, too. He says, take away the right to say fuck and you take away the right to say fuck the government. Uh, and then he does this really good shtick, um, and it's not really a shtick, I mean, it's the truth, where he talks about how, you know, he's going in there and he's being prosecuted for somebody else's act because when the judge calls on the cops who busted him to, you know, testify, they're re-performing Lenny's act, but they're not funny, they're not comedians. And I figured out after four years why I got arrested so many times. See what happened. It's been a comedy of errors. Here's how it happened. I do my act at perhaps uh, 11 o'clock at night. Little do I know that 11 a.m. the next morning, before the grand jury somewhere, there's another guy doing my act who's introduced as Lenny Bruce in substance. (laughs) Here he is, Lenny Bruce in substance. A peace officer who is trained for, to recognize clear and present dangers, not make believe, does the act. The grand jury watches him work and they go, that stinks. <laughs> but I get busted. And the irony is that I have to go to court and defend his act. Uh, <laughs> you know, the thing is, is ap- he was absolutely... Uh, and he spent a lot of time trying to convince judges to let him do his act for the juries. You know, it was enough for these judges to read this stuff on a piece of paper, let alone a tape be played in a courtroom, a yeah. public courtroom, uh, because in a sense, that would be turning the courtroom into a comedy club. Um, at least that was the the fear. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it is true. And, you know, Lenny kind of became um, uh, kind of a... Um, teach yourself lawyer um, 
he was far better as a comedian than he was a, was a lawyer. Uh, I mean, the truth be known. Uh, and um, well, by the Kitty, way, Kitty Bruce, his daughter, would talk about like how he'd carry around law books. You know, them. he and, was, and you know, he he tried his best. Tried. I mean, there's a phone conversation that I think is on our CD, uh, the Trials of Lenny Bruce, where he's talking to Harry Calvin, and it, and he's talking about the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the First Amendment, and as a law professor, I must say. It is a bit much, uh, <laughs> but but um, this is not to say that he didn't have his moments and that he didn't uh, uh, realize things. By the way, I want to give a shout out too. In Los Angeles, there's a young lawyer, uh, Burden Marks, uh, who uh, really represented Lenny Bruce quite ably against, uh, among others, a young prosecutor named Johnny Cochran, uh, uh, was one of Lenny Bruce's prosecutors. No way, the, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the Johnny re- Cochran, of course, is the guy who was on OJ. Simpson's defense. That's system. right. That's yeah. right. The Johnny Conkin. But I mean, the real, uh, um, the ultimate, the nightmare prosecutor was Richard Q in New York. Uh, and uh, with a vengeance, uh, he went after uh, Lenny Bruce. And I want to just say a couple things about Richard Q. Um, he graduated from Harvard Law School. Uh, he's dead now. Uh, he graduated from Harvard Law School, um, and he was a public servant. I mean, he really was. I mean, he could have made a lot more money going into another practice. Tried to become DA, right? Yeah, he did, and more about that in a moment. But and and in many ways, he was he was a good guy. He was right on consumer issues. Uh, I think he was right on women's issues, right on environmental issues. Uh, you know, a prosecutor prosecutes crime, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't fault him for that. Um, and the guy had a lot going for him, but you know. There was just something in his DNA that didn't sit well with Lenny Bruce. And this was his tragic flaw. And, um, you know, I, um, I remember talking to him. Um, he didn't agree to give us interviews. He, he wanted us to sign this contract, giving him liberty to edit our book, and we weren't going to do that. But um, I remember saying to him, I said, you know, Mr. Q, uh, when it's all said and done, despite all of the wonderful things you've done, what people will remember most is Lenny Bruce. And he said, absolutely not. He says, Lenny Bruce is quickly becoming, you know, a name of the past. And when Richard Q died in the first paragraph of the New York Times obit, the man who prosecuted Lenny Bruce, mm-hmm. as well it should be. And, you know, it's I don't say that with glee, because it's really a tragedy, because this man really was, in many figures, in many way, respects, a, um, a committed uh, public servant. And, and he did a lot of wonderful things, but um, this was his tragic flaw. When he tried to become DA, wasn't there a number of uh, luminaries in the New York City artistic community who took out a New York Times advertisement, right? So, yeah, uh, and there was, a, there was a bad boy who worked uh, for the Village Voice, and he had uh, went after Q with wild abandon with several pieces he wrote. Who was that? Uh, um, it's not Nat Hentoff. Let's you know. see. Yeah, it was Nat Hentoff. <laughs> Nat, there's your shout out. I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to talking about freedom and First Amendment freedom, yeah. um, you know, they just don't make them like Nat Hentoff anymore. But Lan- Nat Hentoff really was the man that brought Q down or kept him from going up. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the Lenny Bruce story was was back. Yeah. And we have to remember, too, that Lenny's troubles weren't confined to the United States. Wasn't he also banned from the United Kingdom and, yeah. and Australia? Like yeah. banned from right. a country. Yeah, actually, actually they uh, threw him out. They <laughs> took him to the airport, put him on the plane, and... Uh, no way. Sent him away. By the way, there are He's still... trying to do that with Donald Trump now, right? There are still, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, from what Chuck uh, uh, Harder tells me, there are still uh, performances uh, in England and, and uh, tapes that we have yet to hear that have been, they exist somewhere, but they've been lost to time. So there's so still a challenge out there. out there to all those ambitious yeah. researchers. Yeah, Go yeah. find there, those tapes. They, they are still uh, still out there. Uh-huh. Um, 
But by once Lenny is convicted two to one, he, he appears before a three judge court. And by the way, uh, he was represented ably by Ephraim London and Martin Garbus. Uh, and then just before the end of his trial, he fires both of them. Uh, certainly not because of their lack of talent. I mean, they did a, a good job, uh, but he wanted to do it himself. And now catch this. So he fires his counsel just before the end of the trial, although they've done a wonderful job. Yeah. And he decides he's going to represent himself. Not a smart move. But his first motion is he approaches the bench, three judges, and he serves each of them. Um, he's suing each of them for violating his First Amendment rights <laughs> under federal law. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy shit. I mean, you know, this is like bizarre. But uh, <laughs> trying to pierce their qualified immunity. There's, there's, uh, yeah, that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, and he's convicted um, uh, two to one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 sends to Rikers. He leaves. He leaves the state. And, you know, recently I wrote about when he appeared in, uh, at UCLA, he spoke in UCLA. It was his second to last performance. I said not long ago that it was his last, but the, he appeared um, at, um, um, uh, with uh, Billy Graham on a um, Fillmore West uh, uh, concert with um, uh, the Mothers of Invention and others. Um, but, you know, by February, it was clear that... Um, his demons had gotten the better of him. Um, he was depressed. He was divorced. He was bankrupt. He couldn't perform at any clubs. He had the New York conviction. Um, things were about as bad as they can get. And, you know, when I heard, I went back and I listened because um, Chuck Carter had sent me um, the, the video, the, the audio of his uh, February uh, 1966 uh, performance at UCLA, mm -hmm. at the lecture series. You know, it wasn't funny. It was sad. And by that point, it was obvious that he was broken. And he would tell um, his girlfriend um, at the time, he said, um, I think I'm going to die this year. And, um, and Graham, after he had performed, I think in June, uh, said that the performance was a disaster and that he, this was the demise of, of a great, of a great of a yeah. comedian. So, you know, as I said, he died... Uh, he died before he was dead. Um, and if you just stop the story on August 3rd, 1966, uh, that would have been the end of the Lenny Bruce story. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, he died of an overdose uh, on the same day that... Of morphine. Were, morphine, the yeah. same day they were foreclosing on his home. Right. Uh, but that Lenny Bruce, you know... As you say in the Can We Take a Joke, the phoenix then rises. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> death was his best publicity agent. Uh, Lenny dead uh, was much more uh, viable than Lenny alive. Um, there were plays on Broadway's. Uh, the Essential Lenny Bruce uh, book had been released. Records now being released. Um, Bob Dylan writes a song about call, it. Called Lenny. Uh, yeah. Nico from the Velvet Underground <laughs> does that. If anybody remembers those folks. Uh, those folks, in case you don't know, were uh, the folks that uh, influenced a group called the Talking Heads. So that takes us up a couple of generations. Yeah. Um, but... Um, uh, uh, so you have the Broadway play, Lenny, and then you have the movie uh, by Dustin Hoffman, and then you have the performance film, a documentary on Lenny Bruce, and all of a sudden, into the 70s, uh, Lenny Bruce is, the name Lenny Bruce is a cash cow. By the way, for a variety of legal reasons, um, and it's tragic, None of the, very little of that ever went to Kitty's way. Yeah. Uh, or the family's way. Um, yeah. And there was a lot of theft and a lot of legal maneuvering. And uh, it is a sad story. Yeah. And um, she's doing great work right now to honor her father's legacy, re-releasing his autobiography, but also having the Lenny Bruce Memorial Foundation, which helped um, give scholarships to people mm -hmm. who are trying to overcome drug abuse. And working with the people at um, uh, Brandeis University, yeah. uh, uh, where they have, I emphasize, some of Lenny Bruce's papers because I'm <laughs> delighted to say, and I hope I can say it, uh, that our current plan, at least as of August 3rd, uh, 2016, is the complete unedited 
trial transcripts, yes, from San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, in total, will appear on uh, the First Amendment online library uh, to be launched by FIRE. And I'm so excited uh, that that's happening, and I'm so excited to be working with the folks at FIRE, and it'll all be available free. Uh, so if it doesn't happen, I just want you, but I have every reason to believe it, it will, will happen, happen and I'm, it is happening. Uh, you know, we're working and, diligently to put that website together. And, and, uh, and they'll have it all there for the first time. And uh, it's very exciting. So uh, Brandeis, uh, eat your heart out. <laughs> Lenny, Lenny, you know, the phoenix rises, uh-huh. as you say. Who who started that, or did it happen right after he died? I mean, did, was it Lenny's death? Bam. Well, you know, the title, the subtitle of our book is "The Fall and Fallen Rise, Rise of yeah. an American Icon." Again, the book is "The Trials of Lenny Bruce: oh, The Fall and Rise of an American Icon" by Ron Collins and Ron. David Scover. If you buy the book, you also get an accompanying CD with a lot of Lenny's really good, you know, acts, and it's narrated by Nat Hentoff, who we mentioned. And if you get the tenth edition, or no, the anniversary tenth anniversary issue, which is available. Um, in digital format, uh, you also have audio links and what have you actually in the in oh, the book. Really? Yeah, it's top five books uh, did that. Well, it's we actually funny because it comes with a CD, but yeah. no one has CD players. No, anymore. well, My laptop you can get you can player. get the digital form uh, yeah. from top five books. So anyway, um, you know, it's it's strange. Um, as I've said before, and David's made the point, um, something remarkable happened on August fourth. 1966. Henceforth, never again, nowhere, not in any of the 50 states, not in the District of Columbia, not in any of the territories as far as I know, was a comedian ever again prosecuted, persecuted for word crimes in a comedy club. It's almost as if the Supreme Court had issued a ruling. I mean, that's how big it was. And well, George Carlin was arrested at Summerfest in Milwaukee, but not prosecuted. Not, so you're yeah. right. So they they learned wrong. a lesson. And George Carlin says, I learned a lesson. Who was at, arrested with Lenny Bruce at the Gate of Horn. Yeah. Lenny Bruce called him a schmuck. Yeah, he was arrested <laughs> not for a kind of routine, but for being a smart aleck. When yeah. they asked him for his ID, he said, I don't believe in IDs. And, you know, that, that got him in the paddy wagon with Lenny. Yeah, but uh, George Carlin said, as soon as he was arrested, that he learned a lesson from Lenny, which is, as soon as that sort of thing happens, hire a civil rights attorney. Yeah, uh, but they. I think the police learned their lesson. And, yeah, you know, so or the prosecutor. So said. you know, none ever went to trial. That's what yeah. they meant. And and um, uh, this is rather significant. This is huge. Uh, we can kind of think of all sorts of reasons, but um, you know, I like to think that you know there was a certain guilt. You know that there's something terribly wrong that had gone on. Uh, Lenny ceased being a man and became a myth. And America fell in love with that myth. Um, And um, today, uh, Lenny, the Jewish comedian, is the patron saint, if I can use that, of all comedians. I mean, Mm -hmm. their freedom, whether or not they want to exercise it or not, is anchored in what Lenny Bruce did um, for those 35 months and 1,062 days when he was persecuted, prosecuted, and tried in courts. Yeah. August 4th, I mean, it, it seems like instantly people recognized what he had meant to the culture. The New Yorker uh, wrote that Lenny had a huge appetite for life and all its transiency, absurdity, and potentiality. His delight was in questioning those who had given up trying to find answers. But the questioning was never malicious. Lenny Bruce was a chronic oct- optimist. I think those words are beautiful. And those people that came after him, I mean, you talked about how that one prosecutor said he wouldn't be remembered from... Dick uh, you. Yeah. But you, in a piece that you published for Concurring Opinions and also a cross-post on FIRE's website today, at the beginning of that piece, you quote a separate prosecutor mm-hmm. uh, who said, we drove him into poverty and bankruptcy and then murdered him. We all knew what we were doing. We used the law to kill him. It's yeah, powerful stuff. yeah, it, 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 it uh, you know, it just kind of shows is that uh, law can be a shield, but it also can be a weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, when you think about liberty, when you think about freedom, you have to think about the comedy club owners. You have to think about the lawyers. You have to think about 
the judges. You have to think about journalists. Shout out to Nat Hintaw. Mm -hmm. You have to shout. Pretty fucked up guy, but Phil Spector in his time, he picked up the tab on Lenny's um, uh, funeral and was responsible for helping create uh, the myth, and I say that in a descriptive way, not in a pejorative way, of of Lenny Bruce. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, as I wrote today in the piece I did for Fire, um, you know, as to why do we kill comedians? Um, We kill comedians, don't we? Um, I'd like to see our First Amendment hero alive rather than dead. Yeah. Uh, And I just, and this kind of gets us back, Nico, to where we began, and that is... um, with Lenny Bruce, and I think Harry Calvin got it, uh, and I may be taking a liberty to her here, but I don't think so, but if I am, I'm sure one of my professorial colleagues will call <laughs> me on it. But I think he understood that the, the whole idea of having a free-spirited Lenny Bruce meant more than idealized notions of the pursuit of truth, romantic notions of democratic governance, um, fantasized notions of self-realization. Of course those things are important, and of course those things are part of the First Amendment. But the First Amendment also is a commitment to risk. It's not a suicide pact, but it does mean that from time to time we're willing to roll the dice. Did Lenny Bruce and the likes of Lenny Bruce and the people who fall in, did they make our culture more coarse? Perhaps. Did they make us feel more insensitive to certain things? Perhaps, right? But if you're not willing to take a chance, if you're not willing to risk something, then there's no real freedom. There's no real liberty. And so uh, I come to praise Lenny, but not Lenny as the flesh-colored Christ that glowed in the dark. I come to say, praise him as this, that... Um, he represents the American who's unafraid to exercise his liberty. And if he crosses the line in exercising that liberty and offends people, then the response, as Justice Brandeis said, is not to silence him, it's to counter him, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not to shut him down by the government, but it's to respond to him. And in our day, if there's speech that's offensive, if there's speech that smacks of sexism or racism or um, hostility to people based on their religious beliefs, we need to counter that with everything in our might. And you don't counter it by pushing it under the rug. And I think um, when you think about Lenny Bruce, it means that we as Americans are willing to take these risks from time to time. And to be honest with you, I think at the end of the day, we're the better for it. But as Oliver Wendell Holmes said in one of his opinions, Law like life is an experiment. Sometimes experiments fail, but I much prefer taking this experiment than going with the one they have in North Korea. I feel much more comfortable with putting my uh, stock on the Lenny Bruce's of the world and the Christopher Hitchens of the world, who we were talking about earlier, um, uh, than the kind of mindset uh, that fosters um, lockstep uh, allegiance to a belief or a creed or a, a political ideal. Yeah, where the governments can jail your words. Lenny Bruce mm-hmm. described what prosecutors were trying to do to him. All along, all along, I'll be rich, but so all. And then he got a posthumous pardon, uh, due in no small part to your efforts. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, most people thought that uh, Lenny Bruce's conviction in New York in 1964 had been reversed because um, though Lenny died in uh, 1966, Um, the club owner, Howard Solomon, took an appeal. And his appeal went all the way to the high court in New York, which is the Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, Howard Solomon prevailed, which meant, he was the club owner, which meant that if Lenny Bruce were alive, his conviction would have likewise been overturned. And so people had assumed, 
mistakenly that Lenny Bruce's conviction had been overturned. But as David Scover and I realized, we're law professors, no, it hadn't been overturned. And we thought this was just, uh, you know, just a bad way to end things, you know. So um, when after our book, The Trials of Lenny Bruce, came out, uh, I'd contacted... Um, Robert Corn Revere at Davis Wright Tremaine, a very noted First Amendment lawyer, and had told him about this idea that I had with, along with David Scover about petitioning Governor George Pataki to posthumously pardon Lenny Bruce. Yeah, New York governor of the, at the time. Yeah, and, um, you know, it says a lot about Corn Revere that he, he agreed to, <laughs> to do this. I mean, first of all, who knows the fuck about posthumous pardons? I mean, <laughs> even as law professors in season, I mean, that's a really specialized area. There are probably like three people in the country that work in that area, um, and particularly at the state level. Uh, but he, he agreed to undertake it, and we also started a petition campaign, and uh, Penn Gillette, and, and, uh, who really played an instrumental, very key role in bringing on um, other comedians and prominent figures. Penn Gillette, I just listened to a podcast he did about Lenny Bruce. I was a huge Lenny Bruce fan. Uh, lends a uh, note to the reissue of his autobiography, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which he said when he first read made him want to uh, be Jewish, do drugs, and move to New York City. <laughs> <laughs> all, of, I, all of those things sound, I, I'm the only non-Jew I know. Uh, but in any event, um, so, uh, you know, he went to work and did a lot of original research. And then we had a press conference here in New York, uh, and we were wearing red buttons that said, Pardon Lenny Bruce. And I'm holding yeah. one uh, right now. Oh, I had it upside down. No wonder you couldn't read it. <laughs> and I'm going to give you this as a little token of my oh, appreciation. And uh, so we had this press conference. Um, and Associated Press picked it up. And, you know, the, the, the thing is, this was me kind of, and along with David Scover and others, being a free spirit, you know, kind of howling at the wind, uh, you know, if you will. Um, we didn't think, honestly, that, that it would happen. I'm, I'm obviously Bob Corn Revere put a lot of work into it and mm-hmm. did a very skillful job. job. But when you when you petition a governor for a posthumous pardon, first of all, this is not the top of their list, and second of all, they don't even have to respond. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't have to say yes, no. We'll think about it. We'll get back to you, or this is why we say yes, or this. They don't have to do anything. So you know, I think on December twenty third, Bob Corn Revere calls me and he says, in a, in a moment. In five minutes, your phone is going to start ringing for a week and nonstop. And I said, what happened? He said, they pardoned Lenny Bruce. And I thought, wow. Wow. And um, so, um, you know, a shout out to George Pataki um, for doing uh, the right thing at the right time. And I'm going to be very excited uh in October to have the honor of um, interviewing uh, the former governor as to why he post- uh, posthumously pardoned Lenny Bruce. But he did make some incredible statements at the time about his commitment um, to free speech and how um, the record need- needed to be corrected in this case. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, in the long history of New York, going back to the 18th and maybe even 17th century, there has never been before, since, or Thereafter, a posthumous pardon. This was the first and only. It's an incredible part of the story. Yeah. Well, I think that's a beautiful note to end on. So I want to thank you, Ron, for coming here and uh, for celebrating Lenny's life and for doing all that you do to help my generation and other generations remember it. All I can say is I'm on fire. (laughs) You had to. You couldn't resist. (laughs) Thanks, Ron. Thank you for having me. That's Ron Collins. He is the author of The Trials of Lenny Bruce, The Fall and Rise of an American Icon. You can catch Ron in the fire-supported documentary, Can We Take a Joke? The movie is now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon Instant Video. And it's also available in 228 million North American homes via satellite providers and cable providers, including Verizon, Comcast, and DirecTV. Um, As I've mentioned before on the show, Lenny Bruce's story is the through line for the film, and it features comedy legends Gilbert Gottfried, Adam Carolla, Penn Jillette, Lisa Lampanelli, and many more, and also free speech luminaries like Fire's own Greg Lukianoff and the Brookings Institution's Jonathan Rauch. 
This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and recorded and edited by Aaron Reese and Chris Maltby. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. To learn more about Lenny Bruce, you can check out our past interview with Kitty Bruce, his daughter, as well as George Carlin and Richard Pryor's daughters, Kelly Carlin and Rain Pryor. You can also, of course, check out the reissue of Lenny Bruce's autobiography, How to Talk Dirty and Influence People. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. Again, that is 215-315-0100. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider rating us and posting a review at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.